Amnesty International and others knock federal government as Minister of Information Lai Mohammed rubbishes the Lekki massacre report. And the Inter-Party Advisory Council, IPAC, calls for President Buhari to assent to the amendment or the amended 2021 Electoral Act. This is Plus Politics. I am Mary Anna Cole. The Minister of Information and Culture, Lai Mohammed, has described the report of the Lagos State Judicial Panel of Inquiry on Restitution and Victims of SARS-related Abuses as one laced with discrepancies, inconsistencies and was unverified fake news. He insisted that nobody was killed at the Lekito Plaza on October 20, 2020. He also said the panel only wasted taxpayers' monies by coming up with such a nonsensical report, and he labelled it Tales by Moonlight. Well, joining us to discuss this are journalist Abdul Lahi Hassan, Carl Chinedu, and public affairs analyst Uche Chuta. Thank you very much, Abdul Lahi, for joining us. Good to have myself join you today. Yes. I'm going to start with you, Abdullahi. Um, you obviously are a journalist, you're Nigerian, and um, you obviously are looking at this from outside of the country, and you are wondering, obviously, what's, what's happening uh, in the country, especially with the information minister calling the report that was just released, Tales by Moonlight. Um, what do you make of, you know, what's happening right now? Well... Good evening. Um, let me start off first that it was really a good um, attempt by Nigerians, with thousands of young Nigerians, including women and um, youth, who in October 2020 uh, went out in mass to protest against the uh, police brutality and also called for, uh, you know, the SARS, um, tactical police unit of the police to be uh, scrapped. That was a good move, but again, people died and there was um, destruction of properties which of course led to the setting up of the panel of inquiry um, to investigate these killings uh, at the Lekki Gates in Lagos State. Now, a lot of us out there, I mean, the international community had um, wanted to see what the outcome of this report would be. And um, it's really not a good uh, say out here, especially with Lai Mohammed, because what we do know is that what he says oftentimes is not what the government intends um, to, to dish out to the public. And even when he's being quoted as saying something, he goes back later and said, no, I didn't say that. So it's, it's like us having you know, Trump in, in Nigeria, so to say. But really, it is disappointing to have a lie Mohammed, um, somebody that knowledgeable, you know, who has been in the limelight and the public sector for well, for a decade in the respond to such a report you know he it's enough to say that you don't agree with all the findings but to describe a report as it tells by moonlight a program which you know in the 90s was one of the favorite shows i watched because it's really like uh, a tale for children is really unprofessional and if this is anything to go by i want to believe that lai mohammed wasn't speaking on his capacity as the Minister of Information of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, but really speaking for the entire government and including Mohamed Buhari himself. And I would want to conclude by saying that this is an attempt um, by the government to throw a blanket on this report in a way to say we are not interested. And if at all there's a push for the recommendations to be implemented, we will not go ahead with that. Because he said it, not is going to change their mind on that. So a minister should not speak to people like that because Nigeria is already tensed. We have issues of insecurity coming from almost all the regions or zones of Nigeria. Unemployment is on the high. But inflation is today two digit. That's enough problem for Nigerians to deal with already. And you don't want to respond to them, you know, in such a manner which he did for me. 
if we are in a civilized society, and especially a person of like Muhammad who thinks he knows it all and is highly educated, I think this calls for um, his resignation. Well, um, talking about resignations now, um, it, one of the um, lawyers that was on that panel, um, um, Adeboruwa, as at yesterday, was calling for the mm -hmm. resignation of not just, you know, the governor, he's calling for resignation of, um, before, before we get to the resignation part, he, he is being threatened, by the way. Uh, if you've been following this story, um, a, young yes, lady, I, I've been following. a young lady who testified um, um, in front of this panel was um, almost butchered yesterday. She was left for dead, but thank goodness she's alive. Uh, Kem uh, Kemka, I think that's her name, um, she, she made it. Uh, and she was threatened, you know. And this is what Adeburua is also saying, that he's being threatened. And he thinks that these are government... Um, goons, for the want of a better word. He thinks that these are supporters of the government. But I, I'm, I'm wondering, if the state government, if Lagos state government put out all that money, time and energy and put together a panel to investigate, because when, the first, when people were making arguments as to whether or not people were killed or soldiers were even uh, dispatched to that place, the first question was, uh, well, where's the evidence? Um, how are we sure that this is true? But then the panel has mm -hmm. come up with a report and now people are being targeted. Uh, as a journalist and as someone who's watching from the outside, I'm wondering, um, what do you think the government really is going for? Because is the government not ready for the truth? Or is it that they're not ready to deal with the consequences of what this report is supposedly to bring? Yeah, I think I'll go with your second option. Yeah, the government, the government, no, when, we, when we're talking about the government, we need to look at it um, in its, um, um, how would I say, 360 view of it all, which includes the executive, you know, and um, the legislature, and of course, um, the judiciary. Because if it goes down, a lot of people will fall, because there is no way that the military will, it doesn't matter who was there, the military or the police or the Demopola, as they are called, they cannot on their own authorize that dispatch or deployment to any area at all they call a rat spot or that has been exposed or, of course, um, has some uh, tendencies of, of violence, you know, uh, you know, taking place. They cannot be there without an authorization. So what they are trying to do, <laughs> my take here is nobody wants to fall. Nobody wants to fall, including the state governor. Nobody really wants to take, nobody wants to show that, that responsibility. But you see, until we have people who become accountable, not only to their words, but actions, then we are not ready to change as, um, as a society, as a state, and as people. We are not ready to do that. So nobody wants to go down. President Buhari, for all I know, is going to end his tenure when? Um, 2023. Um, so he's not thinking less, he's not thinking much about what the outcome might be. But among the ministers, we have some of them who for now, as we know, have intentions of becoming governors, but are not talking about it yet. They're waiting for the right time to, to declare or make public their intentions. You have uh, honorable members, you have senators, all four I know have long-term political ambition, uh, say in the next 20 years. Nobody wants to go down because they feel that if this goes down, um, it's going to somehow create a dent in their political career or credentials. So nobody wants to take responsibility. That's what I see. Carl, uh, you, you work with um, civil societies, and um, this is also a cause for concern. I'm curious. Um, governors of states seem to be very quiet on this particular issue. Lawmakers seem to be very quiet about this issue. A report is now out, which it, one way or the other is indicting not just one person, but many. Even the, um, the Nigerian army, the Nigerian police, and governments at all levels. Because again, the army takes its order from its boss, and its bosses take orders from the commander-in-chief of the armed forces, which is Mr. President. So again... Um, what's your take on all of this imbroglio, or for want of a better word, hula baloo? Hula baloo. Carl. Yeah, can hear me? I can hear you. Go ahead. 
Well, uh, the issues are very simple here because one, the president is the commander in the armed forces. So, like you rightly say, the armed forces take direct command from him. And we know that the peculiar nature of our security situation here, that no state governor can even order the military out of their barracks without the go ahead from the president and commander in chief. So, I think that the box stops with the, treble, the president on this matter. Whatever the Nigerian army did on the field comes back to him because he is their commandant in chief. He is the number one military person in Nigeria, whether he is a civilian president or not, because he has that authority as commander in chief. So, whatever the military did at the Lekito gate comes back directly to President Muhammad Buhari because they were acting on the orders. Mm. Interestingly, I, 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 and I wonder, why do you think that the lawmakers and our governors seem to be a bit more quiet on this issue and not pushing us? We heard them very vocally when they were talking about um, VAT. Now, again, we're also not hearing anybody else other than those who have political ambitions talking about this issue and pushing. I'm talking about the likes of the former Vice President, Atikwa Abubakar. We've also heard from the former Senate President, Saaki, who obviously has intentions to run, and other politicians who have political ambitions. Those are the people we seem to be hearing. But those who seem to be serving us, those who we voted into office to represent us and represent those people who were killed, seem to be very silent about this. Why do you think that is? Well, uh, like I said, there's a sense of collective sense of guilt and shame over the Leki uh, massacre because the political class for the first time we are actually brought out in the true colors that they, they deserve to be. So, and besides too, the fears of uh, another round of riots is also keeping all the political uh, actors together in one boat so that like, let us stay together and make sure this thing doesn't erupt once more. I think that uh, it is actually very sad that people are no longer talking about the lives that were lost at Lakey, but instead they are, uh, I will uh, this is unnecessary debate so, of actually whether it took place or not, but that is the normal nature of Nigerian ruling class. So, like, once more, I think they are, all, they are all in it together and they want to cover it up so that you wouldn't get out of hand. Uche, this is interesting. Um, how about young people, the average young Nigerian? This obviously um, is something that is worrying. Remember, just recently, um, there was a, an attempt to protest and march on the anniversary of the deaths of people at that toll gate. And we saw the might of the police. We saw the might of, you know, the government at that toll gate. How does the, the aftermath of this, I mean, the report has still, is still being you know, looked at by the government, but this report has been given. We've heard some of the important parts of this report made public. Um, and we hear that even after the army had left the Lekki toll, the police came back to do some more damage. And with all of the back and forth, with Lai Mohammed calling it uh, you know, a tales by moonlight and saying that there are many inconsistencies and it's fake news. How does this affect the psyche of the average Nigerian and the average young person who's fighting for good governance, who's asking for a better life and asking, you know, that the police will stop um, uh, wrongly profiling them? Well, the, 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 they wanted to come out again on October 20th and the police went to Lekki Tollgate and stood there trying to stop them from having a memorial. It wasn't even a protest, it was just a memorial of the lives that were lost. Now, the, the, the issue is actually bigger than we are actually talking about. It has international ramifications. Buhari and his government are basically right now on trial for international crimes. And maybe because he feels he has some immunity, um, nothing's going to happen. But they have to deny this as much as they can because come 2023, a case is already being lodged in, in the Hague International Court for crimes against humanity, shooting innocent civilians. And this is what they're afraid of. This is why everyone is quiet. It's a big deal. It means political people in political office may not be able to travel freely after 2023 and not be arrested. It's a crime. You just like it's a Tiananmen Square or, or a, you know in, in Nigeria. 
you can't do something like this without any ramifications. The, the international community is watching and they're waiting for 2023. And immediately his term expires in 2023, elapses, this is going to take a whole new dimension. And this is the reason why Lai has to deny this to the last. Even with overwhelming evidence, he has to deny this government. They, and, and, and you're going to notice, only Lai is going to talk about this issue. No other government official is going to say anything. <laughs> you know who to be quoted. Lai has not moved past his mode, campaign mode. He still feels he's in yeah. a position mode in the APC, trying to wrestle government from the PDP. So he hasn't changed. So he can see anything. That's that's a method that has worked for him. It's still working for him. He's not. He doesn't have the capacity to move to, move to become a, an official of the federal cabinet as a minister and speak as a minister. He doesn't have the capacity. It's asking for too much for him to speak as a minister. So he's going to keep on saying things like this, but he's going to be the only one speaking like this. Everyone is going to remain mute because they know that anything they say can be held against them in the court of law, international court of law. Mm. I'm, I'm still going to push you on the issue of the psyche of the average Nigerian, what, what happens to us, because we see a mass movement. People are leaving. It's now a thing, you know. I go on LinkedIn and I see people asking Nigerians if they're interested in moving away from Nigeria. And so many people are raising their hands because they seem not to be comfortable in the country. So um, if we're seeing so many people move away from the country for fear of whatever, um, what does this now playing out and, and the fact that government is making a caricature of it or a joke out of this, what does it do to the psyche of the average Nigerian who's still staying here and having hope that there will be a better Nigeria? I mean, it demoralizes us. You know, like on, on, on October 20th, you know, when, when, once this report came out and the government began to deny it, people were downcast. Young people were downcast. We, 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 we relieved the memories all again. First of all, the report came out, we were thinking about it, then the government denied it. And there's uh, sadness, and uh, but the, the truth and the reality of the matter is that all Nigerians can't leave the country. In as much as I have hoped and I wish that that can happen, it's still our country, and um, we, we 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 have to live with this. We have to keep on fighting. We have to keep on hoping. We have to um, still try and keep our, make our leaders accountable. Yes, there's despair uh, amongst young people, especially with the way government is denying it. But there's some small glimmer of hope where another government, Lagos State government, released this report. We operate, we operate a federal system, and Lagos is a federating unit of Nigeria. So there is still hope. Um, just because some people at the center are denying it doesn't necessarily mean they happen. It doesn't mean there won't be restitution. It doesn't mean that justice will not be served. We are hopeful, um, so we, we, we're not going to lose hope. This is a, a, it, we, are, we are happy that this happened. Because it means that there's some small hope. It actually gives us a sign of hope that things might change. I'm going to come back to you, um, Abdullahi. Um, if, yeah. there's a, if there's a collaborative um, oath of silence, per se, um, by all concerned, including those who are in the political class, like I said earlier, and who are supposed to represent us, or those who used to speak up before but are now silent, um, I'm thinking, um, what happens come 2023? Is this going to affect... Not just the um, ruling party, uh, but of course the opposition, because most of these people who are in the National Assembly and some of these governors uh, are also part of these opposition parties. Again, every state, most states where these protests took place or where there's been reports of police brutality, set up panels um, to look into this issue. But it's only Lagos State that has followed through. So what happens to those panels? Should we not be asking those questions in the other states? Uh, again, nobody's talking about it, and why? Now, um, first off, I don't believe that Nigeria as a nation, if at all, there is. We don't have an opposition party. We don't. Because if you observe clearly, the trend has been that people from PDP, after a while we crisscross, they jump over to APC, after a while, when it's near election time, they, they decamp to, you know, like that has been the trend. People just keep jumping from one party to the other. So there was a never really a healthy opposition anywhere in Nigeria. That's one. Um, two, you, you would understand clearly, like the states where um, people were killed, including police officers, you have Vekiti, you have Oshun, uh, maybe and parts of, uh, of the north, for instance, 
they are all APC states. So for me, people are still not practicing democracy as it should be practiced. So it's more about the party, the interest of the party, and who we, we owe our allegiance to, as opposed to what benefits the society and, of course, putting national interest first. So if this happens uh, come 2023, well, this is where I see you to have the qualification who have the necessary requirement and um, the knowledge, you know, in terms of leadership. Now, leadership, I mean every sense of it, not leadership because you are a boss at home, you have a family, a wife and two kids. That doesn't make you a leader. I mean, a leader who understands when to take actions that even if it means hurting people next to you, but you have to. Now, what happens is, uh, what will happen is that uh, definitely there will need to be a change of government and we need to have people new, people out of the system as we know it now, people who are yet to enter the system, you know, take, um, occupy um, sensitive positions. And this is the time for us to start now. So beyond answers, let's have people like uh, my, my co-panelists, one of them is quite young, you know, to lead a campaign where people with the requirement, people with the qualification can come together already and see how leadership, you know, can can come back to the youth. And because you cannot have somebody's people from the 70s and the 80s use that old mentality to govern a state where, like, everything today has changed. We are now at the modern age, you know, 21st century. You know, this needs to change. You know, that's what I see. Okay. Um Back to you, Carl. Um, again, as civil society, he, he's he's made a like he's made a great point. We need to fight. But how do we fight? Why? I'm asking this. Every single time, a group of people, and it has nothing to do with answers. A group of people stand up against the government. It's either we see a group of people that are being paid to stand against those people and speak for the government, or we see the full might and the power of the government, whether it's federal or state. Again, how do people fight? Twitter is, is still, it's now become a back burner issue. Nobody's talking about it anymore. And so if you have money, you can use a VPN and go, and, go ahead and vent to the space because nobody's going to listen to you. Um, so some of these rights have been taken away from the average Nigerian. You really can't protest. The government is going to come out and say you've not been stopped to protest. But the, again, the Lagos State Police Commissioner, Odumosu, will come out and say you're not allowed to protest. Don't come out. Tell your children to stay at home so how do you fight what do you do how do you go about letting your voice get heard without losing your eye your arm or even losing your life uh, well uh, it is a supreme irony that the government that came into power two protests has done everything possible to ensure that protests are outlawed and um, Actually, it's sad work. And uh, of course, how does it affect the psyche of Nigeria? You can place it, place it, uh, just suppose this uh, side by side with what will happen in any other country. Which soldier will open fire on somebody waving the national flag and singing the national item? Nobody does that. And that was the mindset that these young stars went to with, with the look Lake Gate. Of course, everybody was told that, oh, as long as you uh, have a national flag, Think national term, nobody will touch you and will throw the horrendous massacre that took place in Lake. So, well, if you ask how does it affect his psyche, it actually does. Because for, for once, Nigerians are confronted with the specter of a government, a country that does that does, do not care for its citizens. And of course, it, it, it it's also not perfect that people should be, will be making every effort to jump the boat, jump boat and leave. So as uh, with regards to 2023, I really don't know what's going to happen because the, uh, the answer is the question is who is going to vote and for who? Mm -hmm. Like you said, they have shut down the, uh, the social media space, they have shut down the protest space, they have shut down virtually everything, and of course, with insecurity across the country. So, I Nigerians are really scared right now, and I don't think that even if you call a protest, I do this, you'll be shocked that a lot of people won't come out because the government has demonstrated that it is capable of doing anything. What's the picture of mother? 
Of course, we've seen situations where those who protested at the NSA panel in Lagos are being targeted and are being attacked one after the other. So, the, the, the atmosphere in the country right now, especially for the young people who are putting civil society and everywhere, is, there is this palpable fear everywhere. Hmm. This government can. Uh, well, uh, Uche, you, you have the last word, and with the bleakness that I, I sense in, 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 um, um, in Carl's statement makes me really not know what to ask you, but I, I will ask. Um, so going forward, what's the shred of hope that we can hold on to? Because there's nothing we can do. Like you said, we all can't run away from Nigeria. It's our country, and we cannot be run out of our own country. So what do we do going forward? What's the shred of hope that we need to hold on to? Um, what's that thing that the average Nigerian who's watching tonight can hold on to and that, that can give them hope? Well, let's, let's continue participating in the civic processes. Um, civic processes in the sense of voting and also putting yourselves in position to be elected. Uh, yes, I understand that the, the electoral system has been hijacked by the states, even security forces which ensure their candidates of choice always emerge as winners. But, it does, but they still can do so much. They, they, can, they can still, if we participate in the numbers that we came out on October 20th, um, 2020, they can't rig the elections the same way they've done it before in the past. So we, we need to come out with force. We need to show ourselves on that election day and uh, say, you know what, let's build up. Let's build up momentum to the voting day. And the same way we built up momentum in 2015. When the present government was in opposition and they riled up Nigerians and told them all sorts of scary stories of corruption and this and they're turning Nigeria into uh, some utopian state. Let's, let's build ourselves up in that momentum. I like the way you keep on stressing 2023, stressing about change of government. Keep it on. Uh, let's hope. And let's, 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 let's be our final push. Let's be our final push and say, you know what, 2023, let's we're pushing or pushing for candidates in, in, in the National Assembly and governorship position as president, people who will do the right thing. And we're going to come out on that day, regardless of rain, sunshine, whatever, and we're going to put in and uh, vote in candidates who represent our ideals and the Nigeria we want. Okay. Well, uh, Abdullahi Hassan, Carl Chinadu, and of course, Uche Chuta, thank you very much, gentlemen for being part of this conversation. Thank, thank you for having us. All right. Well, thank you all for staying with us. We'll take a short break now. And when we return, the Electoral Act Amendment Bill is at the forefront of this conversation. Stay with us.